today is our programming language, Reach, which is designed for helping you write DApps um, in as easy a way as possible. I'm going to talk a little bit about our organization and the structure of um, the Reach programming language, but I want to spend the majority of the time today um, doing programming of an, an app. Now, if you want to follow along on the code that we talking about, um, what you can do is you can go to our website, which is reach.sh. If you go to reach.sh, you'll get to this site right here. And if you click on come to our workshop at DevCon, then you'll see our Reddit here. And the Reddit has a copy of the slides that you can open if you would like, as well as a link to our Git repository for this workshop. And that Git repository will look like this. And in the repository is all the code that we'll be writing today. If you want to follow along, then you can start from the um, initial version and um, you know, enter code as we, as we start. Um, and then after, eventually we'll get to a point where we've written the entire reach part of the program. And then we'll switch and talk about uh, making the client side code. And the reach version is minimal, less than, less than that, that has all of those features. And then the final code will be the final one. This is our target for the end of the day. So if you want, you can look at those things. Now, to use the reach language, um, right now, to use the compiler, you'll need to have Docker and Docker compose themselves, and of course, have a basic Unix environment. So if, while I'm talking in the introductory part, you want to go to the site, check it out, and then from the base directory, go into, say, final, and write make clean build run, then that will make sure that you have all the Docker images downloaded if you want to follow along. But if you don't want to follow along, then you can just do this later. And there will be uh, value in you know, experiencing the rest of the function. Now, our team is Chris Winter. Chris, will you raise your hand? Um, and then me, Jay McCarthy. Uh, so, Chris is a serial entrepreneur who's had a lot of experience in the space. And my background is that I am a research professor at the University of Massachusetts, Lowell. And I'm also one of the developers of the Racket programming language. So Racket is a list-based language that's very popular uh, as far as list-based programming languages go. Um, it's commonly used in a lot of uh, colleges and universities. Um, and my research has mostly focused on doing verification of progressive protocols and formal verification of other systems. So the Reach project, the Reach project really represents the culmination of my research. Now, our goal as an organization is to try to dramatically lower the barrier to entry to blockchain. So we think that there's a huge amount of potential in this space, but right now it's just too complicated to build real apps. And our goal is to dramatically lower that. And we'll show you that today by building something here over the next 40 minutes. Now, the idea of the Reach platform is that we want to solve three problems. We want to abstract over the decentralization platform. Right now, Ethereum is extremely productive and popular. There are many people who believe that there are problems with Ethereum and other, um, and other platforms, but it's too risky to invest in one of these other platforms. If you write your product in Reach, then you will be able to compile to a different platform. So we are trying to, um, we're trying to live up to the right ones run in many cases. The next thing that we want to solve is that we want to make sure that the um, that the dApps that people write are trustworthy. So a major part of what we'll be talking about later is the way that formal verification is integral to the operation of the Reach compiler and the way that Reach programs are written. Finally, um, part of being trustworthy is ensuring that there is consistency between the expectations of contracts and the expectations of the clients. And the way that we sort of realize that in the Reach language is that it is not a smart contract language. It is a DAP language where when you write your program in this one language, you get the clients that will uh, that will drive the behavior of the contract as well as the contract itself. And there's a guarantee that they are consistent with one another. Now we have some interesting techniques that we use to do that. And I'll talk a little bit about that before we focus on the code. Now, one of the ways that we get the abstraction of being able to provide to go to many different decentralization platforms 
is that we have a very um, straightforward, constrained model of what a blockchain provides. Our idea is that we really think of the blockchain as providing um, common knowledge about a monotonically increasing data structure. And those, um, those adjectives, you might say, they really like uh, constrain all the ways that we look at what a contract and what the clients provide. The contract is this repository of knowledge, and the clients react to that information and um, attempt to add things to it uh, if necessary. And so, I'm not going to go into the details here. I just want you to understand sort of what our big picture is. Now, the other principle um, that we use inside of Reach is that the Reach language performs a lot of sophisticated analysis on your code. At the most basic level, we have a, 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 um, a sound type system, as you should expect in a modern language. In addition to that, however, we have analyses that are particular to the needs of dApps. As a, one little example, one of the things that we'll see later is the way that Reach uses information flow security to guarantee that secret information that is known only to particular clients is not shared without being explicitly declassified. Now, the way that we do verification is that we take the program written in Reach and we convert it into an SMT problem. SMT is one of the classic problems of computer science, and there are many extremely reliable and performant theorem groups, like C3, that can automatically discharge the obligations. Um, and so a major part of the way that Reach is structured is to make it so that we can automatically produce this SMT problem. Our goal is to provide formal verification without any interaction from the user during the proof process. So that means that we have to be able to discharge all of the proof of obligations automatically. And the only way that we can do that is having a highly constrained language. Now, we have a lot of different kinds of properties that can be expressed um, inside of Reach programs. At the highest level, we have basic systems level properties that should be true of all dApps. Think of like if you're programming a C program, you never want to have a null pointer exception. And you don't actually need to know anything about the program that you're running to know that it should have that property. So similarly, part of Reach is to automatically synthesize properties like this that make sense for all projects. On the other hand, we also have the ability to write down particular uh, properties of relevance for one application. In the same way that when you're writing a C program, you will have custom assertions that only make sense for your program. So we have the same logic inside of Reach. And again, we'll talk about this later. Now, the next thing um, is that, as I mentioned, the Reach language provides, specifies the entire program. And we use a process called endpoint projection to extract each of the individual pieces of the program out. Again, I'll talk about this in a moment. And actually, let's just skip this for a moment. So that's kind of a roadmap of where I want to go. And now let's switch and dive down into the code. Now I want to say actually one more thing, um, which is that um, Reach is the culmination, sorry, is the, is the evolution of another DSL that I worked on previously at another co company making open source products called Alacris. And that other language is called Alacrity. And Alacrity is also available um, and has, we've diverged development in the last few months. And there are different things, different features in the Alacrity language as the Reach language. And I'm very happy to talk to anyone about what those differences are um, offline. But I want to make sure that sort of acknowledge the background of the project. So now what I'm doing is I'm going to switch and go over to the repository. <coughs> so in the repository, we're going to go into the initial directory. And this is the code that we'll be working on. Now, if you open this, there's going to be a lot of boilerplate stuff that's to make it so that it can run effectively. Let me just comment a tiny bit about this before we open up a particular file. So, <clears throat> when you use Reach, um, to make it so it's as easy as possible for all of you to use, everything is entirely dockerized. So when you run the application, sorry, when you, when you compile the application, it compiles it into a Docker container that you can then run. That Docker container is automatically configured to connect to a testnet that it also spins up. So you don't need to worry about that part of testing. 
Similarly, you don't need to download any, download or install anything about the reach compiler. The reach compiler is the shell script down here at the bottom, which is eight lines that configures a Docker instance for you. So there's a lot here that's going to make so that those things will all be linked together. But we're going to be inside of this file right here, multisig.rsh. So that's going to be our reach program. Here's what we're going to start off as. So, in the reach language, you are writing in a subset of JavaScript. So the syntax is exactly the same syntax as JavaScript. Almost all normal JavaScript features are available, um, and they mean roughly the same thing, but there are many special things. So, for example, um, let's start by talking about what we're going to build and what the uh, overall model of a reach program is. What we're going to build today is an abstraction of a multi-signature wallet. The key idea of a multi-signature wallet is that many people collaborate to pool funds, and then when they extract those funds, other people have a say on whether or not the extraction happens. So we're going to abstract that idea to two accounts, a parent and a child. The parent makes a deposit on behalf of the child, and the child can attempt to make withdrawals that must be explicitly approved by the parent. So this is not a product that when we're done today, we're going to launch and become blockchain millionaires. This is an abstraction of what kinds of problems people attempt to solve on the blockchain. Um, and it will, it's small enough that we can do it in the next 30 minutes. All right. So the first thing that we want to do is we want to specify that this protocol involves two different part participants the child and the parent. Inside of the reach language, one of the things that you do is you specify each one of the parties, and then we'll write one program down here, this main function. And this main function is going to encode the behavior of all of the participants, as well as all of the smart contracts. So <clears throat> the first thing that we'll do is we'll have the child attached to the contract. We'll do that by having the child make a publication. Now, the idea of the blockchain is there's this monotonically increasing data structure of the history of all events that were added to it. In this case, we think about that as being a publication to all of the other parties. So when we call child.publish, we're saying that it's the child's responsibility to publish this information. Now it turns out that there's actually nothing that the child knows originally, it's just the way that they're going to connect. Now, every time you expect to see a message on, um, in the protocol, we have to say what would happen if the person who's supposed to do this didn't do it. What if they, um, you know, what if they time out, for instance? And so we always specify what will happen in the case of a timeout. And timeouts are expressed um, in terms of how many blocks you're willing to wait for a message. So we're going to just have this very Miller program delay, which is going to say the message has got to come within delay seconds. And if it doesn't, then we'll fail. And the way that we'll fail is that anyone, that's what this underscore means, anyone is able to submit a message. And what this message does is it will commit the transaction and then say that we have finished running the protocol. And the reason that I'm returning this array of 0 and 0 is because at the end of the protocol, when we're finally done, we're going to return how many times parent said yes and how many times the parent said no. So if the child times out and never joins the protocol, then we're done and so no events actually happened. Now, after we do this, now the code has transitioned down here and we are now inside of the contract. So at this point, we need to verify anything that must be true about the publication. Now in this case, nothing was actually published, so there's nothing to say, so we commit the transaction. And now we go back to a context where we're outside of the protocol. The idea of the reach language is that you switch between local blocks where a particular agent or many agents are simultaneously doing things, and then synchronization or consensus blocks. And in those consensus blocks, all of the parties are doing the same thing, and they agree on all of the information that they're doing about it. Let's do an actually interesting example. So after the child has joined the protocol, we now want the parent to. So we'll write parent.only. 
So this is something that only the parent will do. Now, what do we want them to do? We're going to have them run a function. And so we'll specify that as a function, as a function of no arguments. And what they'll do is they'll compute what the allowance that we're going to give is. Now, <clears throat> notice that this is a circumstance where it makes sense that the, at this point in the protocol, the parent is always going to decide what the allowance is. But in our reach program, like, how do we know what you, the particular parent, are going to give to Sally before she goes on her, you know, spring break trip? How are you going to know? Well, there's two ways that we could do this. The first way is that notice up here, when I wrote, when I defined the parent, I said I had this empty object right here. So in this spot, you can write initial information that every that, that participant starts the protocol with. So we could add in here uh, knowledge of what the initial uh, allowance is going to be. Instead, what we'll do, though, is that we will interact with the front end. So we'll call it interact. This is a special object inside of the reach language that represents the client that will ultimately run the parent part of the program. So we're going to take that object, and we're going to call allowance on it. Now that's going to return a value, and we need to assert that that value is going to be an integer. Now, this value right here, we want to eventually provide it. So we'll go next, and we'll say parent.publish the allowance. So we're going to publish to the rest of the world that the allowance that the child has access to is this number. Now, unfortunately, if we try to compile the program right now, it is going to fail. And it's not going to fail because I have this dot here. It's going to, it's going to fail even if we fix that. The reason it's going to fail is that this program fails to satisfy the information flow security system. The reason why is that all the information that comes from the client, comes from the front end, is assumed to be secret information. It must be explicitly declassified. So what we'll do, we'll call declassify on this. And whoops. And now we've declassified it and we're allowed to publish it. So good, we've made some progress. Now, the next thing that I want to talk to you about is how every time we make a publication, we, com we can combine that with um, a unit of value that will be transferred to the contract. So we write that by saying pay. So we'll actually pay the allowance. And we'll write down the timeout code. So every program, every interaction on the chain must be accompanied by what would happen if there was a timeout. We refer to this property as kill safety. The idea is that your program has to be safe with respect to any participant refusing to to engage in the protocol at every point going forward. So in this case, what we're saying with this timeout block is we're saying, what if the parent never did this publication? What should happen? Now, with these early stages of the protocol, there's really nothing interesting to say. That's why they just end. But in principle, um, as we go forward, there's going to be more interesting interactions that are going to happen inside of the timeout. All right. So now, at this point, we are now inside of the contract. The contract has access to the allowance, and we need to go forward. The thing that we want to do going forward is we want to have a little while loop. And this little while loop is going to repeatedly allow the child to ask for funds. Okay. So we'll write while loop. Now, what is the condition that's going to tell us that we're done? Well, the condition that's going to tell us that we're done is, is that the balance is going to be zero. When the balance is empty, then the program will be over. Now, val is not some like special variable that we're going to have to do that. We're going to have to keep track of what the balance is. Okay? So we're going to say that while the balance isn't zero, continue running this part of the program. So we'll define a new variable called the balance is going to be equal to the allowance. Right. Now, <clears throat> just so that we have something interesting to return, the other thing we want to do is we're going to keep track of how many times we said yes and how many times we said no running the program. So how many times the child asked for money and the parent said no. 
We don't, this isn't that like, important. We just, you know, it's just fun to keep track of something. And then that's the information that we're going to return at the end. Okay? Now, there's one last thing that we need to do. And it's actually kind of a big thing. <coughs> when you're doing formal verification and you have a while loop, the while loop represents a point in your program where many, many different things can happen. There's a version of this program that runs where you reach this point and the allowance was zero. And since the allowance was zero, we never execute the code inside of here and we go right to the end. There's another version of this program, of this program executing, where we run the inside one time. And after running it one time, all the balance is gone and then we exit. There's another version where we run it two times and so on. There's in fact an infinite number of different ways to run a program that has a single while loop depending on how many times you go around the value. So this is a big problem for formal verification, because how are we going to know what the program will actually do? Because a way to think, a way to internalize what formal verification is, is you're making a prediction about what the program will do. Now, one way that we could do this is that we could automatically take the program and verify it for when we went zero times. Verify it for when we went one, verify it for when we went two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, etc. And what we would be doing is we would literally be like copying and pasting this code inside of the verifier over and over again to verify each one of those different versions. That's called iterative deepening. And iterative deepening is what you do in situations where you can't figure out how to capture that infinite behavior. We do not do that. Instead what we do is we have programmers specify a loop invariant. Now, if you remember from your analysis of algorithms course, where you use the CLRS book, this huge computer science book. You probably learned a lot about loop invariance. And if you're like me, you hated that class. Okay? It was very frustrating. Okay. Most of the time, though, the key idea of a loop invariant is what do you know before the loop starts, and what do you know at the end? So the thing that we know is, is that the balance in the contract is equal to this balance. Okay? And if anything that we do inside of this makes it so that that statement is false, then we'll not be allowed to we'll not be allowed to compile this program. And what this is going to do is it's going to allow the compiler to make it to verify this more efficiently. We're going to verify everything above this to make sure it establishes that invariant. We're going to verify the inside to make sure it preserves it. Then we're going to verify the end so that it also verifies it. What this means is that we provide complete verification of the infinite behavior of your program by just proving three smaller theorems. Okay. Alright, so now let's go inside and do some stuff. So we were inside of the context of the consensus, so we have to commit the transaction and now go back to the world where the two participants can do something. And the thing that we want to do is we want the child to do something herself where she's going to ask for a certain amount of money. And we know that this money will start to be classified and is going to be a number and will interact, interact with the customer, sorry, sorry, with the front end to request the money. And the way that we're going to do this is that we're going to tell the front end how much money is in the account. So it can you know, know how to display to the user, you know, Sally, do you have $100 available to you? How much do you want to so this interact object is not only a way to get information from the front end, it's a way to share information with the front end. So it's a two-way street. Essentially what's going on is that this reach program is specifying the API to the contract, the API to the clients, sorry, the API to the back end, and then we'll write on some client code afterwards. Now, the next thing that we need to do is write an assertion that's going to say that how much had better be smaller than or equal to the balance. Because this program wouldn't make sense if that were not true. This assume function right here is one of the verification assertions that we can put in. I mentioned before, and you can go look at the slides if you'd like later, um, that there are different kinds of assertions that you can put in. Assertions are things that always have to be true, and if they're not, we refuse to let you compile. Assumes are kind of like require, if you're familiar with that, in, um, in solidity where we actually check this property at runtime. But the other thing that we do is we make sure that all the assertions later on in the program are entailed 
by these assumptions. So later on in the program, we're allowed to write down asserts. And if any assert would fail because you forgot one of these assumes, then we'll refuse to compile your program. The idea is that we are guaranteeing consistency between the clients and the contracts. We're making sure that your program at runtime actually verifies all the properties that are necessary for your contract to run um, correctly. Okay. So now what we'll do is we'll have the child publish the amount. <coughs> and we'll write in the timeout code. And the timeout code will be allowed, uh, available to the parent to run. And if she, if she times out, then we'll just say that it is an automatic ignore. So it's not, an, it's not a yes or a no, but we just continue the protocol. So what happens here is that rather than returning at the end, we say that all of the variables that the loop is iterating over, they stay exactly the same. And then we continue the loop to the next iteration. If we wanted to, we could say that if the, if the timeout happens, then it like goes in favor of the uh, of the child, and she gets the money. It's up to us to determine what we want to do. This, by the way, is one of the one of the one of the examples that the reach language is different from my earlier project, the alacrity language. Because in the alacrity language, the timeout blocks are automatically generated on your behalf. You're not able to, but also you don't have to specify what they do. Instead, they automatically end the protocol and give all the money to the last person that could have Okay, so now we're inside of the contract and we will require that how much is less than the balance. So this protocol only makes sense going forward if how much is not more than the balance. Now it looks like what we're doing is we're saying something twice. We're saying it up here and we're saying it down here. And of course we literally wrote down how much less than the balance two times, but we did it for totally different reasons. What we're doing right here is we're saying that this protocol makes no sense unless this is true. What we're saying up here is that I am a bad client if I don't check this property. And you have to specify both of those things if you want to have a correct program because you're writing down the client and you're writing down the contract. And one of the things that we'll do in the verification process is make sure that the contract only interacts with good clients. So if we left out this line, then this line will fail to verify, and it'll say, you need to have your client check that how much is less than the balance. Because of course, in the actual, um, in like your actual front end, you don't want to submit a transaction and have that transaction fail because you failed to check it before. Okay, so then we'll commit the transaction, and now we're back to a local context, and we'll have the parent go, Find out if she is approved. In this case, we'll get back a boolean because uh, the interact object doesn't only return numbers, it can return arbitrary information. So we'll interact and we'll say, we'll all approve, and we'll tell the front end, here's how much she asked for and here's what the remaining balance is. Then what we'll do is we'll publish that approval. And we'll have to deal with what happens if there is a timeout. And we'll do the same thing as before, whereas if, if there's a timeout, if the parent never gets around to it, then in this case, we'll call that a no. And we'll continue. Okay, so now we're back inside of the context for the, client, for the, uh, for the contract. <coughs> And now, the contract knows the balance, it knows how much money was asked for, and it knows whether the parent approves. So at this point, we can actually um, make the transaction. So we'll say, if the approval is true, then we'll transfer how much to the child. And we'll update our state variables. We'll say that the balance is less than the how much. We'll say that there's then one additional transaction that was a yes, and no no's, and then we'll continue. And otherwise what we'll do is we'll say that the balance is unchanged, the okays is unchanged, but there's another no. And we'll continue. And then at the end, we'll need to commit the final transaction when the balance is empty, 
and then we'll return the OKs and the nils. Okay, so we just wrote 63 lines, and I hope that it felt not too weird. It doesn't feel like writing solidity. It doesn't feel like writing a smart contract. It feels like writing the whole deck. In behind the scenes, what we're going to do is we're going to automatically synthesize the front-end code, and we're going to automatically synthesize the contract. Now, let's go to the terminal and see what typos I made. <laughs> so we'll type make build. And what it's going to do is it's going to run the compiler. Oh, I made no mistakes. <laughs> so I don't know about you guys, but I'm a professor, and a lot of the time my students make, pro make mistakes when they write programs. Okay? This is why you shouldn't hire them to write your verified compilers. You should hire me to write your verified compilers, because I do it right the first time. Now, let's go back for a moment, though, and look at what we wrote. Now, what if we made a mistake? So, obviously this would be totally stupid, but what if we accidentally subtracted how much and then added one? There's an off by one error in our program. Now, I've never made an off by one error in the program, but I've heard of it, heard of it. Okay? So let's try to compile it and we'll see what happens. Oh. Um, I'm suspicious that maybe it's not looking at this file. Um, hmm, okay. Uh, I'm really nervous. So, let me just let me just look at a different thing real fast. What are the what are the annoyances with Docker is that sometimes it doesn't copy things that you think it's gonna copy. Okay, we'll hold off talking about that for a moment. Um, what I want to show you right now is what we made, what the compiler produced. So we'll go to the build directory, and we'll look at the Solidity code that was generated. So right now, the reach language can, in principle, um, produce things other than Ethereum, but right now we only target Ethereum. Okay, so this is the contract that came out. So this program, uh, this contract is absurdly laborious. So it's 152 lines. You can look at it if you want. It's in the it's in the build directory if you run it yourself. And let's just look at like one little part of it. So let's look right here at message six. So message six is a message that has all of these parameters. And let's try to see if what's going on. So it says right here that it must have come from v0. That the block number is less. That's the delay going in there. The value has to be zero. Ah, okay. So this is, this is saying that this is one of the messages that doesn't have a payment with it. V17 has to be smaller than V8. Ah, V17, that's how much. V8 was the balance. Then what we do is we um, commit that and then update the state. So what this message is, this event number six, is the sixth thing in our program, which is this step right here, this publication right here. When the child says, here's how much I want, then we go to the contract and we require that how much is that. <clears throat> I realized, by the way, why the, uh, why the compiler allowed us to comment out that line. Because I accidentally commented out the line that, uh, that was the assertion, rather than the line that made sure that the assertion was right. Um, so I believe that if I comment out this one, we'll get there. All right, now that I'm really nervous, that's going to going on. Okay. Sorry. Um, okay. So, whoops. Um, now let's look at the JavaScript code that got generated. So just this JavaScript code that got generated um, is the code for the child. So we get a new file that's called child that takes as uh, an argument the handle for the contract, we'll see this get made later, and the interact object. And then it goes through and it has each one of the pieces of the program. So let me just make a new window for a moment. And we get multi sync and we can compare the two of them. So for example, look at the first thing that the, the child does. The child calls request on the interact object. 
gives it the balance. I'm oh, sorry, this is in the middle of the loop. Let me go to the top and show the very first. So the very first thing is that we publish nothing, and then we're going to wait for the parent to publish the allowance. So if we look at the code, the very first thing that happens is that the child sends and then receives message one with no information, expecting to receive event one afterwards. Or event two if there was a timeout. We check to see if there was a timeout, and then what we do is we continue the protocol, where then we expect to receive event three. And event three comes with um, V5, this information that will end up being the allowance. Okay? So this rest of the code right here uh, is you know, no code that a human would ever write, but it's very straightforward output of a compiler. It has wonderful things like let v9 equal zero, because what's v9? v9 is the count for how many times we said okay, so it's our double zero. All right, so now what we've done is we've written our program in reach. We've compiled it. Behind the scenes, it's done verification for us, and we now have the JavaScript code and we have the Solidity code. But this JavaScript code that we have, the only thing that it does is it provides these high-level these high-level functions to spin up a child and to spin up uh, the parent. We skip down. There's the one with the parent, and then we also embed you know the details of the contract. Now <clears throat> we only have eight minutes left, so we're not going to write by hand the front-end code. Instead, I'll show you the front-end code. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go out of the, um, that directory and go into the minimal directory and go look at the index.mjs file. So the first thing that we'll do is we'll import the standard library. We'll import that multi-sync program. We'll say that our starting balance is going to be 130, because we're going to test this on them now. And then we'll create a new account for the parent that has that starting balance. And then that's going to deploy the multi-sig um, contract. <coughs> so we do parent.deploy. Then what we're going to do is we're going to define the interact object. And for this first version, I'm going to say that the allowance is always going to be 50 either. So I just write this function that when, the, when you get the call to allowance, I return to either. Now if I were making like a real application, you know, I might have it pop up a web browser window, you know what I mean? Like actually do real interaction with the user. Then we're going to write our approval function. And our approval function, this is a really nice parent. Their approval function is true. Okay? Because this is just for testing purposes. Okay? Then what we'll do is we'll define the parent. We'll go off and we'll run the parent function. So we'll call multisig.parent, give it this contract object that came out of deploy, give it that interact function, and then we'll get back a promise for the answer that will eventually come out of the parent when it's done running. We'll do something similar with the child. We'll start it off with the balance, and just because I'm lazy in this test, I made the starting balance exactly the same, so why does this person want money? But I, the thing is that the, they need to have some money to provide the gas, right? Then the child will attach to the multi-sig contract. And when you attach versus deploy, you have to say what the address of the contract is and when it was created. You need to know when it was created so that you know that you're not sending things that will line up. Now the child, it's going to say, uh, I'm a greedy child. What I want to do, my request is everything. Okay. And then we'll ask for the, um, the parent. We'll, we'll make a promise for what the child will do. We'll await those two and then we'll finish. So let me just pop back for a moment over to the turn over here. And we'll make run. Spawning up the devnet, starting get, waiting for it to be around. Let me make this the text bigger here. Now it's actually running it. Really nervous about my live demo. Now it ended, and it ended, and it said. The parent thought there was one OK and zero no's. The child thought there was one OK and zero no's. Okay. So <clears throat> what this code shows us is that we have 28 lines, and we're able to take our multi-sig program that we wrote and write the wrapper front-end code that deploys it. So this code is the minimal amount of JavaScript code that we would need to write to have something usable. 
you would take this structure right here, and you would build your unit testing library for this particular DAO based on this. Now, let me show you one more version that does a little bit more interesting stuff. <clears throat> so what this version is going to do is it's going to be 41 lines, so it's like twice as long. And what it's going to do is it's going to print messages about what's happening. And the other thing that's going to be different is, is that the parent is going to say that you can have, anytime you ask for money, as long as you ask for less than half of what's left, we'll say yes. So that's what this parent's rule is. You can ask for however much you want, as long as it's less than half. And then what the child is going to do is the child is going to ask for um, a random amount of money that is uh, divisible by an eighth of what's left. So why, why am I doing this? Just so that it will print out lots of stuff. So the child will repeatedly ask for random amounts of money in eighths until eventually it gets down to the point where there's only, I think, one ether left and then it will end. So this new version of the program is going to be more like exciting to watch. <laughs> you know what I mean? But really all I'm showing you is that I'm not developing a app anymore. I'm making a user interface. I'm making a policy for what the parent does. I'm making a policy for what the child does. Maybe here it's an automated policy, but you could have it be instead not an automated one, but one that's provided by a user interface. So we'll pop back to the code for a moment. And we'll build and run this. And I just love text printouts. So this, this is going to be my, my favorite part of the talk. Let me make the text a little bit bigger. So that you can really experience this. Okay, so they deploy the contract. Very exciting. Okay, it asks for, put in 50, ask for none. Okay, well, look at this. Oh man, look at all this money that's going in. Like, there's lots of transactions happening here. And then it's running for a while. Eventually it's going to get down to the point where there's only one left. It's going to take a while. We get lots of randoms. Oh, it's so close. Okay. And then we ended. The parent said yes 13 times and no 13 times. And the child agrees that that's a problem. So what we did to today is we wrote an entire DAO from start to finish in 30 minutes. Now I wrote it. Maybe it'll take you longer than 30 minutes. Okay. And what Reach did for us is it abstracted over the decentralization platform. In the Reach program, there's no point at which I said, here's this complicated solidity idea. Do it. Did I do call or is it transfer? Maybe it's supposed to be send. Uh, let me go look at that Stack Overflow question again. These are the kinds of things that are done, uh, that are decided for you correctly by the compiler platform. The next thing is that we verified that the DAP is trustworthy, or at least we would if my Docker configuration was right and copied the files correctly. So if you want, I'll send you. We'll, we'll post the link to uh, a version of this uh, of this walkthrough where we show uh, the verification conditions failing and then show you how to correct them. And it ensures that the clients and the contracts are consistent. Our 40 line reach program produced 300 lines of front end job short code and Solidity code. And the details of those two programs have to be meticulously connected with one another to make sure that it executes correctly. Now obviously the, the, the 40 line version produces 300 lines that has to be right. If you wrote a real program, not this little model, clearly it's going to be much more important to do this correct. Now, right now we have our beta that has many different, um, many constraints. And I'm happy to talk about those with you later. And we have a release plan for over the next uh, year to expand the set of features out. I'm very grateful for you to have come here. Please check out our website, reach.sh. Please look at us on Twitter and all of the social platforms. You should really check out our Instagram account. I've got a really cute cat that's part of the reach. <laughs> and finally, I just want to re-emphasize that uh, Reach was originally a, pro a project that I worked on with the Alacrity company. And Alacrity is also an available tool that's based on the same principles. And um, yeah, so thank you so much for your time.